Welcome back to Speak Out with Christine Jurgen. Today, we're going to be talking about the audacity of the public school system. Again, the failing state of the public school system. Again, why? Because it is insane what is happening to our children. And if somebody doesn't speak up, who is going to protect these children? If parents aren't fighting these school boards and these teachers and administrators and superintendents who are trying to go after kids and indoctrinate them with DEI and CRT and gender theory and all of these other things that shouldn't even be in a classroom, period, we're going to lose America. I mean, that sounds extremely drastic, but... It's reality. They start with our kids. There's a reason they're going after our kids first. So today I have on Jill Simonian, who is head of PragerU Kids. If you guys follow me, you know I love, love, love PragerU Kids um, and PragerU as a whole. But PragerU Kids has content for children. They have 500 pieces of free content. They have kids shows, they have kids crafts, they have um, books, magazines, workbooks, all sorts of things that you guys can jump on, watch, consume for free. Um, and you don't have to worry about, is there something woke that's going to be coming on? Are my kids going to hear anything about gender theory? Like my then two year old at the time, uh, did when she was playing an app. And during this game, a commercial came on and said, are you questioning your gender? And I'm like, what? My net, my neck has never flipped around so fast in my entire life. And I jumped over the table and I'm like, no, we are not listening to that. But this is what's happening. Our kids are being inundated from every which way to be able to uh, usher into Marxism. I mean, that's ultimately what they want. And that's what we're diving into with Jill Simonian today. She talks about the state of public education, why she pulled her kids out of school, the way her third grader was asked, are you non-binary? I mean, hello. Uh, children are being taught to question their gender as early as kindergarten. Third graders are uh, being told about hormone blockers, and even sixth graders are told that they need to be able to define sexual acts and where to access abortion. If you don't think this is happening, or you think you're in small town America and say, mm, no, not happening here, well, you need to wake up because it is. You need to pay attention to what's going on with the teacher, not just the teacher level. You know, I volunteer in the class, but this teacher would never do that. It's coming down higher than that. It's coming down from the principal or the superintendent or the school board or um, even higher and beyond through curriculum that sometimes gets passed and you don't even know what's in there. You guys, you have to pay attention. And Jill jumps into the importance of fighting for our children because guys, if we don't, who will? Jill, thank you so much for joining us on the Speak Out podcast today. I am really excited to get to talk to you. Um, you're somebody I've known for quite a while now, and you talk a lot about what's going on in the state of education, um, it, what's happening in the country right now. I want to share, before we dive into everything, I, I did a thing on my stories a while back and said, if you've had any indoctrination in your schools or any ad political agendas pushed, let me know. And I did one of those little like question box, you know, these are some yeah. of the messages that I received that I think are important that people hear these things. Um, someone says, my sister's teacher changed genders and kids were forced to address him as a she. Um, someone says, I remember getting a grocery bag full of condoms in middle school. During sex ed, they told us how to get an abortion and how men can have babies. Um, sex ed taught us how to get on birth control and get an abortion without parental consent. Uh, we have my daughter's teacher made students cry saying Trump was going to deport them. My daughter was asked to write about the benefits of abortion. My teacher gave extra credit or an automatic A for students who attended a protest to a Trump rally. Um, we're told Republicans raise uh, children with fear while Democrats use mutual respect. Uh, my biology teacher mocked me for believing in God. I have my own story with what happened in our conservative school in Colorado, where my wow. son, who is biracial, was told that he was a victim of his skin color. Kids went home crying there because the science teacher said, um, if you don't stop eating beef and start riding your bicycles every day, your kids are going to have to live on the moon, which is like right. so ridiculous. Insane. How did we get here? How is this what's <laughs> happening in schools right now? <laughs> I, Christine, I, you know, when you're, when you're saying those things, the messages from real people in real time who sent you these realistic, uh, encounters that happened with their children or themselves, I just, I've gotten to the point now where I laugh and I don't laugh because it's funny. I laugh because we are really living in the clown world. Like, you know, when you scroll Instagram and you, you see the clown emojis in the comments, it, right. that's really where we're at. And we got here, not overnight. And listen, my background for anyone who knows me from PragerU kids and you know, my background 
is in mainstream media. Before I came to work for PragerU Kids and before I started mm -hmm. developing these children's shows, uh, you know, to celebrate America and our values and all that, my background was in mainstream media, in entertainment reporting and pop culture. And then for several years, I did parenting reporting and, and uh, you know, about family lifestyle topics. Very fun and interesting, but I'll say unmeaningful stuff. Sure. And my eyes were very closed to what so many were trying to alert me about, how much our education system was hijacked, how woke our culture has become, how damaging and divisive it has become. I was really blind to all of that. I just didn't see it. And then during the lockdowns, 2020, 2021, when I started seeing what my own kids were learning in our renowned public school district that everyone moves to the area for to attend the public schools, you know, it's one of those, I thought, oh my gosh, this is really happening. And through my own education and trying to learn about how we got here, I really realized that it started 20 years ago, 30 years ago. It started with, there's this fabulous book by E.D. Hirsch, and it's called How to Educate a Citizen. And it's a really quick read, extremely informative, but it talks about how decades ago, uh, our public education system started abandoning classic literature, started abandoning um, the expectation of, you know, setting standards with, you know, kids should learn this type of information in the first grade and then build on that foundation. Here's what they should know in the second grade, third grade, fourth grade. We started abandoning standards and started embracing this whole child, child-led experience of learning. And the problem with that is that... A child who does not know anything, they're like sponges, how is that child going to lead any kind of educational mission for themselves? We need informed citizens, adults, teachers adhering to standards yeah. to get children, to teach children things. And it started with that decades ago, and it's really now just been devolving because the bureaucrats and the teachers unions have adopted all of these frankly insane woke ideas that are not based in truth that are not based in judeo-christian values that are not based in goodness and are just you know throwing them at children there's no right there's no wrong there's no standards there's no expectations uh there's no um you know, here's how you conduct yourself in a, you know, amongst people. Here's how you show people respect. Everything has gone out the window and that's where we're at. It really has. I mean, like out the dang window and down yeah. the street, it's gone. Toilet, <laughs> um, down the toilet. <laughs> right. So when it comes to all of this, you work at PragerU, you guys are doing a lot to combat what's happening in schools. And I want to dive deeper into what's happening in schools here in just a second. But tell us what you guys are doing at PragerU. What is PragerU Kids? Um, I know a lot about it. I utilize it. I'm a homeschool mom. We love it. My kids love Otto's Tales. I mean, all the time they're like, mom, can we watch Thank Otto's you. Tales? Can we all go watch Otto's <laughs> Tales? And I do try to limit their screen time. So I'm like, mm, well. I agree. Fully agree. Fully agree. Yes. I don't even know if it, I don't think it's in here, but I actually printed off the um, president's handbook or the president's uh, guide that you have with the first Thank 16 you. presidents. And I made it into a little spiral notebook. Um, so we've been going through that, which is something tangible that they can hold that um, doesn't necessarily have screen time. But give us the rundown on what PragerU Kids is. What is the goal with it? You guys are now in schools in Arizona. Like, give me all the details. Okay. There's so many details. And I always get, you know, now I get flustered when someone asks me because I literally there's so much to share. So for anyone who doesn't know, PragerU Kids, and we're, we're online for free. You can go to our website, free. PragerU PragerUKids.com. Subscribe for free. We have, we started about three years ago with the intention to teach what should be taught, to teach all of the things that, frankly, our public school system and very, you know, quite frankly, our, many of our private schools now have completely abandoned. We teach goodness. We teach values, American values, hard work, responsibility, equality under God. We teach the foundation of America, how our country was founded upon Judeo-Christian values. We teach about uh, United States history. 
how, uh, you know, freedom, liberty, e pluribus yeah. unum, in God we trust. We want to teach children, uh, to, uh, we want to teach children and parents for that matter, uh, what America is. And no, we are not perfect. We have many videos about history for our children, kindergarten through 12th grade on PragerUKids.com that, that, that introduce and discuss in age appropriate ways some of America's stains, like mm-hmm. slavery, like, you know, some of the things that, that have really been uh, pitfalls in American history. But we talk about how through all these stains, America is constantly working to become a more perfect union. And um, and how America really is the most blessed and free country in the world and how it really is the best place to live. And and we don't believe in this divisive rhetoric that teachers are are that, that, you know, many teachers and especially teachers unions are forcing onto kids. Uh, We don't believe in the divisive rhetoric of judging each other and separating each other based on your skin color and you're a victim because of your skin color and you're an oppressor because of your skin color and you should be ashamed and you should be entitled. We don't believe in any of that. We want to teach children knowledge so that our future generations have a shared cultural literacy as Americans together about what our shared history is and what our current role is now as Americans to be informed citizens to know how our government works. We also have shows about financial literacy and civics, uh, which tackle, you know, the, the older grades, middle school and high school, and those are on our website. But it's really been a beautiful endeavor, and it's a very exciting because we, we're now in 10% of America's states as approved supplemental wow, vendors. So, yeah, so teachers in Arizona, Montana, New Hampshire, Florida, I'm missing something, Oklahoma. <laughs> <laughs> the, the, de- the departments of education in those states have, have listed PragerU and PragerU kids as approved supplemental curriculum so that teachers, if they want in those states, can use our materials uh, for, for any given purpose. Yeah, I think it's great that you guys are teaching kids a well-rounded perspective of what our history is. Because like you said, there are stains. There are some things that we're not necessarily proud of. There are mistakes that we have made, but if you judge something based off of only the bad things, for instance, say you have uh, a husband and when you're, whenever you're frustrated, you go talk to your friend about him and you're like, you know, all you're talking about is the things you're frustrated about. This friend is going to have this idea that you have a really crappy husband, but yeah. really, you're only talking about the bad things. So you're forming their perspective to be a negative one versus we, we tend to not brag on the accomplishments that we have, or maybe our husband is being phenomenal. Or in this case, it would be America. America's done a lot of really great things. And we were one of the first countries that abolished slavery. That's something to be proud of. You know, these things, you have to know both sides of the issue to actually fully understand it. And that's something you guys are doing with PragerU Kids. I love that I don't have to worry about anything woke. Like if I throw on auto tails because I'm cooking (laughs) or something, I don't have to worry about anything. And I've listened to these things. I've read, uh, we have some of the books. I've read them. I've looked at the website and depth. I know it and I trust it and I recommend it to pretty much everybody. Um, you don't have to be a homeschool parent to utilize it. This is a great supplemental thing um, for just parents to do at home with their kids. If they're learning about presidents, which let's be real in public school, they're probably not really learning about our president. They're not. They're um, not. Go to Prager you Kids and you can learn about it. Um, so I want to talk about something. What You mentioned it very briefly because you're talking about how a lot of things are race based and they're talking about, you know, pitting kids against each other because of skin color. And this is essentially, I mean, this is racist, but you know, it's It's because of DEI. Can you explain to those listening, like what is DEI and why is it bad? So DEI is (laughs) diversity, equity, and inclusion, which, you know, it's like, I've now learned in the past few years that language has really been shuffled and modified and twisted and turned to get us to see certain words and say, oh, yeah, hey, diversity. Yeah, we're Americans. We yeah, believe we in diversity. That. 
And then, you know, inclusion. Of course, we all want to be included. Mm -hmm. Treat, you know, the golden rule, right? Treat others as you wish to be treated. That is, to me, inclusion. That is the most purest form of inclusion when you just treat people with dignity and respect, even if you might disagree with them and not, you know, align with maybe some compromised values that they may have. Everyone can be included to have a seat at the table, to have, uh, you know, discussions, civil discussions about, you know, debating different topics. But DEI is an initiative that diversity, equity, and inclusion that has been forced into most of our public schools and most of our private schools. And DEI came, I'll go back to the former public school district that I was in, that I've since pulled my children out um, because I woke up. Several years ago, my former school district hired a DEI consultant and it was to improve the, and this is a quote, climate of care for the district. It was to improve understanding of one another so that our children could not be, would not be raised and educated inside of a bubble of privilege. Mm. And this DEI consultant came in And what this woman essentially did, and I had firsthand reports from various teachers who were very brave in our district, who just knew right away that, you know, there's there's something suspect about this. This DEI consultant came in and gave this huge presentation to all of these teachers talking about how, and this is another quote, the teachers in the elementary school that my children were going to were white supremacy with a hug. And she talked to these teachers and essentially tried to break down these teachers saying that because they were maybe Christian or because they were of of a certain race or skin color, that they by default were oppressors and they needed to reconcile with their own inherent bias and their own inherent racism, whether or not they had said or done anything racist or not. And all of us parents got with of this and we're like I'm sorry what's going on right. this is not this is this is strange this, this you know this is like those uh, you know communist struggle sessions that you hear about when they're trying to implement marxism and DEI is essentially marxism what it is trying to do in real time in school districts with children is to separate children based on race to teach every part of american history and even Things that are not history, like math, or, you know, if if you're giving children literature, to give them literature that is through a racial lens, through a victim-oppressor lens, so that you are inadvertently brainwashing youngsters to see everything through a racial lens and to count how many black people are in the class, how many white people are in the class, how many Asians are in the class to, to see if things are, you know, diverse enough. And if it's not diverse enough, well, then you by default are an oppressor. I mean, this is really what's happening. I, friends of mine who send their children to a very prestigious, prestigious private school here in Southern California, did a Zoom session with students separating them literally by race. If you are a Christian male, raise your hand. If you are a black Mm. female, raise your hand. And they required this group of middle schoolers to separate into groups according to their race. And they had the, you know, some of the students talk about how oppressed they have felt by some of the other students. I mean, it's really brainwashing at its worst. And it's hijacked our education system to the point where now we don't have kids across the board in America. About half of children can read proficiently. Mm -hmm. Half of them can do math proficiently because the individualized lessons in these classrooms has been hijacked with these diversity, equity, and inclusion initiatives. And equity is not equality, by the way, if you don't know. (laughs) <laughs> well, it, it's completely not. But I think they've they've caught on to the fact that when parents hear the words D or the letters DEI, um, that parents 
red flag goes up and they are concerned. So I've seen that it is also um, alluded to as like social and emotional learning, um, culturally responsive training. When you see anything along these lines, it's basically DEI wrapped in a pretty red bow. Um, yeah. And, and I do want to talk about if you do you know about the surveys about the social emotional learning surveys that are happening in schools across the country? Uh, are these the ones where they're asking you, like, if you've ever done drugs, if you've ever yes. like had sex or whatever, I've seen something along those lines. I think my son brought one home a long time ago when I still had him in public school. And I was like, what the crap is this? Like, no, <laughs> uh, but t talk about that. They're really invasive surgery surveys. And these surveys are brought into school districts and they're, vir they're in virtually every single school district across the country. I have done, you know, I have done countless conversations and, you know, lives on our Facebook page, um, mentioning these everywhere from Illinois to, I mean, obviously California, it happens, Colorado. Illinois to Mississippi to, uh, you know, across the country, it, our, Nebraska, these surveys that outside agencies will give to school districts to administer them to children most of the time in third grade and up. And they ask very invasive questions, everything from have you done drugs, have you vaped, uh, everything from that to gender ideology. I remember when my kids were in our former public school, my third grader took a survey and the first question was, are you non-binary? And oh, my, Lord. you know, to an eight-year-old, you're asking an eight-year-old, are you non-binary? Right. And these are just their age-inappropriate questions. They strive to separate the, the child from the parent because a lot of times the schools do not give the parents a heads up. Hey, your child's going to be taking a survey today. Here are the types of questions that's going to be on it. So you blindside these kids who want to please the teacher, who, you know, maybe have a respect for authority, who don't know what to think. And you're really putting them in a situation I remember one of the questions for my eight-year-old was also, uh, when you do well on a test, how guilty do you feel if your friend or classmate did not do as well? And you're thinking, what kinds of questions are you acting kids? You're suppressing their ability to want to excel because you're making them believe that if they do well on something, then they should feel guilty for it. I mean, that is the cornerstone of, you know, what equity is trying to do to, to bring high achievers down. Mm -hmm. And it's really, it, it, you know, it's really tragic and it's destructive and, and parents are now becoming wise to it. And I always say, if your child's in the school district, just, you know, one of the emails at the beginning of the year, you don't even have to know if, when, or how they're going to be giving these surveys. One of the emails that you should be sending is, hello, my name is Mrs. So-and-so, and from, you know, this point through the end of the school year, I am opting out my child from any and all SEL or DEI surveys. Just blanket statement, you're, you know. That's a great and idea. It, yeah. And it's actually, uh, it's pretty wild when you think about all of this stuff, even if your child had vaped, even if your child felt guilty if somebody else um, got a worse grade than them, which they shouldn't, they should be proud of their accomplishments um, and maybe help their friend do better if that's, you yeah. know, something that they think about. But that's none of the business of the school. I think that's the biggest thing is like, None of this is your business anyway. Gender, none of it. Like, none of you it. don't get to know this stuff. So curriculum today weaves racism into everything. They say that math is racist. They say that it's racist to do assignments and turn them in on time, which is just mm -hmm. absolutely absurd. Um, right. Because of the woke agenda and classrooms turning into activism, activism camps, our students are struggling. And you kind of touched on this. The National Ed Assessment Ed of Education Progress... Um, known as the nation's report card, which tests a broad sampling of fourth and eighth graders found that only 36% of fourth graders are proficient in math and only 26% of eighth graders are proficient in math. According to the National Literacy Institute, approximately 40% of students across the country cannot read at a basic level. Only 16% of black children are proficient in reading by the time they reach high school. Um, struggling readers, this was interesting to me, struggling readers so, uh, suffer socially and emotionally, and about 60% of behavior problems occur during reading assignments. So because they're having these reading struggles, behavior problems are starting to come out too. 
and this is really disturbing. This is the last one I'm going to read you before we get to the next question. But it says um, there's even what they call an illiteracy to prison pipeline. Uh, because two thirds of students who cannot read proficiently by the end of fourth grade will end up in jail or on welfare. And some states even base how many prison beds they're going to have or they're going to need on how well children are performing on reading tests. They go to wow. look at the reading test to decide how many prison beds are we going to need in our prison. I hadn't heard that one before. That one hit like a wow. I, 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 I'm really shocked. I, I had never heard that particular uh, notation before I <sighs> it's powerful and it's heartbreaking it that this is what we're doing to our kids and it's because we're more concerned concerned with raising activists and pushing our own personal political agenda on them than just raising a kid who knows how to do their ABCs and two plus two yeah. and I'll tell you what you know a few years ago we had a documentary. It was a PragerU mini documentary, 20 minutes long. It's called The Biggest Bully in School. If you haven't watched it yet, go watch yeah, it. I mean, it is really eye opening. And it's all about the teachers' unions. And the teachers' unions, unfortunately, are really at the root of all of this activism, political narrative inside of our school system and the teachers unions you would think you would think at the teachers unions conferences that they would be giving uh in services and guidance for how to help your struggling readers how to um you know how, how to remedy um children who maybe have behavioral problems how to redirect you think that that's what they would be discussing at these teacher unions conferences but what we found in recent years for the NEA and the AFT is if you go to their agendas for their national conferences, the discussion that they, the, dis, the discussions that they're having at their national meetings are not about improving literacy. They're not about uh, redirecting poor behavior. They're about activism. They're about how to, and, and this is real. Go to the NEA website, click around. I can't remember off the top of my head the exact path that I used to click around, but I have physically done this where I've gone to the AFT websites, the NEA websites. I've done deep dive Google searches where you're looking for agendas for the national conferences and the regional meetings. They're talking about how to infuse gender identity lessons into the classroom. They're talking about mm -hmm. how to um, how to teach history through a critical race theory lens. And yes, it is through a critical race theory lens because newsflash to anyone who doesn't yet know, when you implement DEI practices into schools, that is the practice of infusing critical race theory and CRT. Right. So anyone who says, oh, they're not doing CRT in schools, no, they are doing it in real time by way of DEI. That's the purpose of DEI. Um, they're teaching about, uh, you know, the teachers unions are also uh, talking about um, supporting Palestine. Mm -hmm. That was the number one agenda item in 2022. I believe it was. You might have to fact check me on that. It was either 2021 or 2022, but that was the one of the num one of the primary objectives at the NEA's conference. So you're looking at these teachers unions and you're thinking you're not there to support the children and you're not there to improve education and you're not even there to provide the support for the teachers that you claim to, you know, it's like, oh, we're here to protect the teachers. You're not even there to do that. The teachers unions are there to promote activism in the classrooms and to politicize our kids without our consent. Right. Teachers unions are completely and entirely political. Like you were just saying, AFT, the American um, Federation of Teachers, has donated $90 million to politics. Uh, NEA National Education Associ Association has donated $200 million to politics. And when the, you're talking about the documentary that Prager you did, um, it also talks about in there that that doesn't include the money that they're giving to Planned Parenthood or to the Clinton right. Foundation. And who, where does the, the teacher unions get these money? It's it's from their members, from the dues. Dues-paying members. So dues-paying members. Do you think that teachers just don't, care anymore or they just care more about politics and they care about our children i think 
I've thought about this a lot, and I really do think half of them are maybe blinded from seeing the truth. Mm -hmm. Um, Many of them are also new teachers who have been educated without them even realizing that they're, they've been educated to infuse activism into lessons. And um, unfortunately, you know, I am a part of a lot of groups on Facebook, and um, I'm a part of a few groups that are, in fact, uh, you know, wonderful teachers on Facebook who have, as the years have gone by, continued to ask what is going on, who have continued to speak out in their own districts, who have been reprimanded in their own districts for teaching truth and goodness and and American values. And they've really, and and many of them have really taken a step back and said, you know what, I don't want to be in education anymore. And they have, they've they've exited the industry that they love. And that's something that's really, I mean, we we see it here at PragerU Kids. We have, you know, we have a whole team of educators and professionals who contribute and write and research for our PragerU Kids shows and materials, but many of them are teachers who have, in fact, left the profession because they said, I can't do this anymore. It's too political. I saw, once I saw, they, they, they have told me personally, once I saw what the unions were doing in real time, and once I knew that education was not about teaching children knowledge anymore, I couldn't do it anymore, and they, they've left. And they've come here to work for us, which is great. Yeah. (laughs) But it's really sad because you have more and more teachers abandoning such a, I I mean, you know, my sister's a teacher. My mom was a teacher. My grandma was a teacher. They're abandoning what was once a wonderful profession, educating the future of America. But so many teachers have just lost, you know, they've just become so disheartened about everything and they're gone now. So we're losing and we're left with the politicized ones. Right, right. So this is like a a decades long thing that's been happening that we kind of were asleep at the wheel and didn't really pay attention to what was going on. Or maybe it was something small and we're like, eh, don't like that, but whatever. Or we don't want to ruffle feather, you know, or or what what I found myself doing too, Christine, was, oh, I don't want to be overreacting. Mm -hmm. I don't want to be that parent who's picking every single thing. Well, at some point, we all find the time when we say, oh, I need to be that parent. Yeah. And I think, yeah. Well, it's also easy not to do anything when it's not your kid being affected. This is something that I learned at my, at the school that we were going to in Colorado. Like I said, it was supposed to be a conservative line school. They're supposed to, you know, love America and teach the founding principles and that our founding fathers were great and all of these things. And um, we dealt with a lot of crap and it was, a lot of stuff was happening to my son. And so I'm like, okay, Um, this is happening. This is not okay. And other parents are like, well, you know, it's not that big of a deal, you know, just pipe down. I'm like, if it was your kid, it'd be a big deal. And I would come alongside you if it was happening to your child, but you're not willing to do this. Fortunately, there were a few moms who were willing to come alongside of us. And I'm going to do a whole podcast episode about what we did and accomplished at that school because, um, the principal was no longer there. There's teachers who were Mm. indoctrinating her no longer at the school. And this is from just moms pushing back, which is phenomenal. Um, but when it comes to what's happening in these schools, it's not even just the academics when, I mean, nothing's about academics anymore, really, (laughs) but there's gender stuff that they're pushing on kids. There's kids who are questioning their gender because of what they're being taught. And then there's teachers and counselors and school administrators who are keeping it from parents. Why do they not want parents to know if their child is all of a sudden questioning their gender? This is a big thing in California, and anyone who has been following the um, San Bernardino, or excuse me, the um, San Bernardino area, it's the Chino Valley uh, Unified School District, they wanted to pass a uh, resolution that said parents need to be notified should their child want to change genders at school or go by a different name or a different pronoun or whatever at school. The uh, the school board in Chino Valley said, and, you know, this was several months ago, said, yes, you know, we, uh, we believe in notifying the parents. We are going to notify the parents. And <laughs> California leadership, I'm going to let everyone look it up on their own, but California leadership, gentleman with the last name of Bonta, uh, did not want to have anything to do with that. And he actually yeah. uh, brought up a lawsuit against the Chino Valley Unified School District saying, we do not want yeah. to out children. And we, and it's like 
any reasonable person has to just, you know, get a hold of themselves and say, I don't care what side of the political aisle you're on, you have to get a hold of yourselves and say, okay, these are minors. These are children under the age of 18. As parents and guardians, we are required to sign a permission slip if our child is going to go on the bus to the field trip at the museum. We are required to sign a permission slip and give uh, our approval should our child need some kind of over-the-counter medication at school if they have a headache or if they have an asthma attack or something like that. We have to give approval for every single thing in schools, but you're telling us that the teachers do not need to inform us if our child goes wants to go by a different gender or a different name or you know a, a, anything that that has to do with gender ideology like that's the thing you're saying oh we don't need parental yeah. consent for it's absurd and you know I, planned parenthood the trevor project um amaze.org videos i'm sure you're familiar with amaze.org all of these outside agencies have infiltrated our schools by way of saying that they're giving sexual education. But it's not sexual education in terms of this is how human beings reproduce. I, I, mm -hmm. I, I, I'm, I'm one of those moms that thinks, yes, children need to learn how human beings reproduce. And we do need some kind of sexual education in class. But that does not include changing gender or this radical ideology that is not based in truth. That is not what that includes. But all of these outside agencies are now coming into our schools and, and putting up flyers at schools and the school districts are endorsing it. They're putting up flyers saying, if you're questioning yourself, if you don't feel like yourself, if you are wondering, um, what your sexual orientation is, text help or text talk to this number and you have kids with their phones in middle school and high school, texting these unvetted strangers yep. that have put up flyers in schools. And you, it, it's really, it, it's horrible. It's it, horrible. That was happening in, Col uh, in Colorado. Um, it was, you know, if you're having mental health issues or whatever, you text this number. And a mom actually texted it uh, and found out that they, you know, it was like a gender confusion affirm it. Yes. like if a child was gender confused they would affirm it and it was all these things that your parents aren't going to know about your kid could be texting a complete stranger right now so if you have a kid yeah. who has a phone you definitely need to be looking at their phone consistently and checking up on that i think that's something that is incredibly important when we're putting these little devices in our children's hands that give them access to the outside world um so when it comes to sex education which you kind of just brought up here a second ago um and prager you has a docu doc Documentary that they talked about SECUS, um, which is an organization that brings sex ed standards to schools to teach to students. And this happened in California and vigilant parents fought it as they should. But in the curriculum, it was saying kindergartners should be taught to question their gender. Third through fifth graders um, were to learn about sexual feelings and hormone blockers. Hello, like what? Um, by grade mm -hmm. six through eight, they'd be expected to define sexual acts and know how to access abortion. And there was a book meant for ninth through 12th graders that included bondage, restraint, anal sex, blood play. Why do teachers so boldly want to sexualize our children? I don't know the answer to that question, but the mini doc you're talking about is called Miseducated. And it's actually, it was the, one of the first mini documentaries I did yeah. when I was hired here. And we filmed that back in 2021. And I'll tell you, Christine, what the, the expert, uh, who I, interviewed w w that, that really revealed all of the things you just discussed mm -hmm. about all the, the, I'm just going to say disgusting things that Secus was aiming to teach our children. Uh, the educator that I interviewed, her name is Brenda Lebsack and she is from uh, Orange County, California. And she was a teacher. She was on the school board in an orange, you know, she was on the school board in Southern California, um, in the Orange County area. And she has been sounding the alarm on this for years. And I'm not going to lie, when I interviewed her back in 2021 and she shared all of that with me, I thought, 
oh, there's no way that this can be real. And perhaps she's exaggerating. And then sure enough, when we looked it up and we verified everything she said, no, she was not exaggerating. And you know what else she told me back in 2021 that really has come to light now? She said, this started in California and this is going to make its way across the country in the next few years. And the reason why they are pushing this is to separate children again into victim versus oppressor. This roots back all the way. This is Marxism. She said, all of these weird things that are happening. It's like, you know, as parents, we say, why are they pushing this radicalized gender ideology and sex ed? Why are they pushing, uh, I call it modern day racism? Why are they pushing DEI? Why are they pushing CRT? It all boils down to Marxism, to break a generation's minds so that they are open to not being individuals, not thinking for themselves critically, not appreciating America, not understanding that everyone has dignity and respect and that civil discourse is important. It is for the purpose of pushing Marxism so that this younger generation will embrace socialism. And I know that sounds so out of this world outrageous, but I'm telling you, that's what it is. Listen, that's why we're here. <laughs> There's nothing you can tell me that sounds outrageous. If you <laughs> think this is outrageous to me, I can top it, especially, you know, when it comes to people who are supposed to be like-minded and are kind of just not paying attention. And when it's brought to their attention, they're like, meh, you know, whatever. Um, just a lot of times you get gaslit when your parents pushing back and it's hard to push back. Um, it can be exhausting. It can be uncomfortable. And I think that's something that we need to encourage parents to continue to do, um, especially when it comes to what teachers unions are pushing. So we were touching on teachers unions earlier, but I want to ask the question very specifically. Do you think teachers unions are an education organization or a political organization? Oh, political organization, a hundred percent. And I think that's verified if you go into, like you said earlier, the donations that they give to political parties. They don't give the donations equally to different sides of the political spectrum. It is right. a one-sided political donation in the millions upon millions every single year from the major leading teachers unions. They are definitely pol political organizations. And when you go into their records and you see the numbers and you see the black and white evidence of what they are discussing at their conferences and what they're contributing to. They are absolutely 100 percent political organizations. How can we put our children in the hands of these people? You know what I mean? It just it, it it's mind boggling to me. And we can go into a whole different conversation of that. And I, I pulled my children out of school. I homeschool now. And um, really, I feel like there's just no way to really know what your children are being taught unless you're paying attention to it. And there's so many people not paying attention to it. What would you say to the parent who's like, mm, this isn't happening. You guys are crazy. Okay. Maybe in like New York or maybe in LA or mm -hmm. maybe, um, in one of these crazy like towns like Seattle, but it doesn't happen in small town America. This isn't happening at our schools. How do you respond? It is happening in small town America. I have parents who send me DMs, who communicate with our PragerU email. If you go to our website, there's a lot of times that you can email, uh, you know, you can send us emails and testimonies and things like that. But we have received countless emails and direct messages from parents in some of these small towns saying, hey, with screenshots of worksheets that their kid brought home or a screenshot, a, a, you know, a, a picture that the parent took inside of the classroom where you have the, uh, I don't know what the word for it is. Is it called the trans inclusive flag? I don't, you know, I, I don't know what these things <laughs> are called, but You're they'll so have the now. pictures. They'll have the pictures of the trans inclusive flag in the classroom. They will send us testimonies of uh, my child's teacher gave us this handout today talking about uh, uh, pronouns and gender. Um, I mean, for all the parents who say it's not happening, go to an account like Libs of TikTok. Even mm -hmm. if you are on, like I say, the quote unquote other side of the political spectrum, just go to some of these accounts. These are verified images and worksheets that are being shared widely 
to inform parents that this really is happening in virtually every single school across the country. And yeah. it's disgusting. And th it's hard to speak. I will say this too. It's very hard to speak up and to voice an opinion, especially if your opinion is grounded in any way, shape or form in American values that are so, you know, vilified, wrongfully vilified now. It's very hard to speak up and to find that courage to approach a teacher or send an email to your district or go to your school board meeting or even write an op-ed in your local small town newspaper saying, hey, here's what I've noticed and this is divisive and it's wrong. It's very hard to do that before you do it. But once you do it, that, you know, that phrase, courage is contagious. Mm -hmm. Once you do it, I guarantee, and this has happened to me personally, it's happened to people here who work at PragerU, it's happened to people who I get DMs from. Once you do it, there are people that join you and there are people that will back you up. And it may not be in great numbers at first, but there are people that will back you up and say, I feel the same way. And there's also a sense of personal responsibility where once you do it, yeah, you might get attacked, but guess what? You'll survive it. Yeah. Sticks and stones can break my bones, but words <laughs> will never hurt me. You'll survive it and you will find the fortitude to continue speaking up with truth for the good of the future of America. And I, I say that, you know, that sounds like a big statement, but it starts with your own kids at home. And then it, it really does. It's for, we, we have to be vocal and just get this course correct. What has gone so far, far, far left. Yeah. We have to course correct this. I think it's hard for parents, you know, because maybe they have mom and dad who are working. They're both working outside of the house. They come home. They have minimal time to get dinner ready, clean up, maybe get kids ready for bed. And so they don't have time to look at every single book that the child I don't have time. Absolutely. Yeah. You don't yeah. have time to look over all of the curriculum. So maybe you just don't know. And some people are like, well, it's not happening. But if you look at the curriculum that they're reading, a lot of times you, you'll have a red flag and you're like, hmm. I'm not sure about that. And as far mm -hmm. as small town America goes, I'm here, I'm in Alabama. Um, and it's, I just moved here six months ago. It's all brand new to me, but before we chose schools or, you know, figured out homeschooling, all of that, I talked to some parents who have kids in some of the local schools and there's a local school here and it's, you know, small town have, um, the, there was a senior in her class and she told her teacher, psychology teacher that, uh, men cannot have periods. And the psychology teacher told her, well, that's your opinion. And then the rest of the kids in the class attacked her because she was a bigot. And I'm like, okay, this is small town America. It's definitely here. That school's out because I don't want an entire battle on my hands after I just left a battle. Um, but parents have to, you have to read the stuff that your kids are bringing home. You have to read their books. You have to pay attention. You have to ask questions of teachers. You have to get to know the teachers, um, and go in the classroom. And it takes a lot of time and effort, but our children are so worth it. I it's mean, if it. we don't advocate for them, who's going to? No, it, you're absolutely right. And it's so worth it. And God bless that young woman who really was brave and shared that with her teacher. And those are the types of young people that we're really going to depend on to save our communities and to save the reasonability of our country. You know, I mean, those are the type of young people where we just have to fortify them with truth and say, listen, if you get reprimanded, uh, you have to, you have to have confidence that you are being truthful and what you're doing is right. And that's not to say that, you know, we don't want people to be mean. We don't want to bully people. Uh, but we do want to have strength yeah. in what is real and what is good. And what, you know, I'll, I'll say, you know, educationally speaking, what should be taught in schools. Um, yeah, it's just, it's really, you know, the word is insane. But I really do have hope that the the course will be corrected because of more and more parents who are waking up and the reaction that we have I'll, I'll tell you since we've announced that uh prager you kids is now officially in five states across the country we have received i think the last number is over 600 hit pieces in the press mm. now that sounds 
that sounds to, you know, to the average person, it's like, oh, my condolences. I'm sorry. You've received 600 hit pieces. And our response to that is absolutely not. This is wonderful because what it means is that people who believe in truth and who believe in educating children with truth and history and goodness, we are making an impact. And the fact that mainstream media is obsessed with creating hit pieces and accusing us with lies, you know, of so many things that are not happening here, because we're being attacked so much shows that we are making impact and the parents who support us are making impact and we are gaining ground. So it so it's actually encouraging. <laughs> <laughs> that That is encouraging. It almost alerts parents to if they go look at PragerU and they see the content that you have on your website or PragerU Kids and they're, and they're thinking, well, why is the media demonizing this organization? Everything I see is fine and I agree with what they're saying. Why would they not let this? It kind of backfires on them because it's alerting parents to the fact that, you know, anything pro-America or anything teaching about, you know, what is good, true and beautiful is not allowed in schools these days. So there is that like... Um, you know, like you said, hit pieces can be uncomfortable. However, I think it would wake people up. So when it comes to public school, there are people who think that public school is beyond saving. Uh, Matt Walsh is one of them. You've pulled your kids out. I've pulled my kids out. Do you think public school can be saved or do you think public school is a lost cause? Ugh, this is so hard for me to answer because I was a huge cheerleader of public schools prior to my eyes being open and really seeing the truth of what was going on. I used to be a fan of public schools, and it's very hard for me to admit, but I think the public school system right now is a lost cause. And the reason, I'll say most public school systems are a lost cause, because most public school systems do not have enough brave parents who are mm. informed and educated truly about what's going on, speaking up yeah. and trying to save those school districts. That's why I think it's a lost cause. In California, I'll talk specifically in you know Southern California, there are a few pockets where parents have really rallied. Parents have really rallied in the Glendale Unified School District, uh, which is a very tough battle uh, that I can't say they're unabashedly winning right now, but they are, wow, they have risen up. The Temecula Valley School District in Southern California, the Chino Valley School District in uh, Southern California, those areas have really seen an explosion of parents who are committed to pushing back against everything that's destroying the public education system. And particularly in uh, Chino Valley and Temecula Valley school districts, they have won several battles. Uh, they have won some of their parental notification policies that are just not political, they're just reasonable. They're mm -hmm. just reasonable to notify the parent if the child uh, decides to change their pronoun at school. I mean, these are reasonable, po reasonable policies. And it's because they've had parents turn out in such great numbers um, that they've been successful. Places like Los Angeles Unified School District, I don't have any personal experience with. My, that, that's not the school district that we were in. But I happen to think, yeah, right now, LAUSD is a lost cause. Yeah. Because the parents are not rising and the parents are not informed. And they're, and they're really not putting any sort of tangible activation towards course correcting what's going on there. Right. So I love to always provide, if I can provide a solution, because there's probably parents listening like, oh God, okay, it's a lost cause. Well, what am I supposed to do? <laughs> doom and gloom. Yeah. It's doom how, do I, how do I handle this? What am I supposed to do? Like what other options are there besides public schools? How can we handle this? What, like, what is the next step for those of us who do think public school is probably a lost cause or somebody who's like been struggling with the idea that they want to pull their kids out of public school, but they just don't know how to make the leap. And like, what are the options? So I think the uh, one of the options first and foremost is because I fully recognize not everyone can, but it's not practical for everyone to homeschool. And I know there are a lot of advocates that say anyone can do it. I respect that and I, I support that, you know, I support that go-getter attitude, but realistically, no, not everyone can homeschool and I fully acknowledge that. One of the 
primary solutions that that we really are trying to provide is an antidote. If you have a child who is in a situation where you know that their education is compromised, first thing you need to do is, like I said, opt them out of every single social emotional learning survey that may or may not be coming their way during the school year. Opt them out. Get them out of that system that is striving to confuse them and victimize them. Okay, get them out of that situation. Secondly, provide the antidote in educating your kids with what will what 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 will teach them what they should be learning. And that's something that, you know, we I I I hate trying to say, oh, you know, go back to PragerUKids.com, but it really is the mission here of what yeah. we're doing. We have made the videos that are short. Yes, they are educational videos. We we call them broccoli for the brain because it's like we're giving the broccoli and we try to sprinkle all the cheese on the broccoli to make them easily <laughs> digestible with colors and music and you know fun things that will, will that will spark children's interest to watch. But we have given the videos that are teaching about our history, about how we are all equal under God, about um, you know about um, how our system of government works. We're giving these videos to give kids the knowledge that they should be learning in schools so that they so that they learn it so that they appreciate it so that they have a connection with it and then so when they go to the classroom and they're fed the garbage that child can then say wow this isn't what my parents and I discussed and this isn't what I am learning at home and that's garbage but I'm here in this classroom and I'll be a student here, but I know that that's garbage, what the teacher is feeding to me. So that's what we're really trying to do. We, you know, everything we make is to equip the parents to, to give us the resources because guess what? I don't know everything about presidents. I don't know what I, I, there's a lot of history that I don't know, but I need the video to be able to pull and say, let's watch this video about Ida B. Wells, and let's learn about this black American who was a journalist who tried to, you know, shed light on so many things that were happening during her time. So that's what the antidote is. We, we, I, as a parent, I utilize the car when I am driving my kids mm -hmm. to and from. It drives them crazy, and they whine at me, and they say, we don't want to hear your lectures. And then I make a joke, and then we all laugh, and I continue to lecture them. But we have to teach our kids our values through these tools that we are able to grab. And PragerU Kids is one of those tools. So that's what, that's that's my antidote. <laughs> yeah, so for the people, yeah, and I'd say, you know, obviously there's public school, there's charter school, which is a public school. So, eh, like, they can be better, but the, in our case, it necessarily wasn't. Um, there's, uh, private school, there's micro schools, there's all homeschool, all of these things. Um, and regardless of what you do, actually, when I was considering public school for my son here in Alabama, before I learned what was going on, um, my thought process genuinely, I'm kidding you not was okay. If I agree to let you go to a public school because you want, you know, the big school experience and you want to play football, the school you go football to, games, and yeah. Yeah. yeah, if you do that, you have to watch a PragerU video per day. <laughs> yes. So that was what yes, I was thinking yes, about. I was it. like, I have to be like combating this from a different perspective. Um, and fortunately he didn't end up choosing that school. We sent him somewhere else. He's at a private school. My younger two are homeschooled, but regardless of where your children are, a, you have to advocate them. You still have to stay vigilant. Even homeschool parents have to stay vigilant. Um, but I think your resources at PragerU Kids, and even at PragerU, especially for the older kids, the five-minute videos are, I mean, mind-blowing how much information you can pack into five minutes. And I'm like, wait, yeah. what? I mean, this would have been a two-hour class at school, and yeah. I probably would have forgot it, but I have it in this nice little box of a uh, five-minute video. And I remember it and it puts it in such a way that you can understand it. So utilize these resources, especially, especially when they're free. Like I cannot, like most people say I can't homeschool because of the money or I can't do this because of the money. Prager is free. I want to ask, is there, and this would be maybe be a behind the scenes kind of thing. Is Prager you looking at doing um, a more robust multiple subject curriculum at any point in time or having their own curriculum or doing their own, like, is there anything in the works like that? So I'll tell you what we have right now. Right now we have over 500 pieces of content for K through 12. 300 of those are videos. 
200 of those are uh, what we call books or, uh, you know, magazines and or worksheets. So we have worksheets that are uh, companion worksheets, I want to say, for mm-hmm. many of our um, for many of our series. Like there's a series about civics called Street Smarts. There's a series called Cash Course about financial literacy. All of those come with accompanying worksheets. As far as uh, I think you said more robust curriculum, we're actually in a really great sweet spot right now where we are looking at all of our kids' content. And this is behind the scenes. This is, you know, privileged information, Christine. But we're looking at all of our content and we're saying, okay, wow, here's what we did in the first three years. How can we expand this? How can we go deeper? How can we, uh, you know, be more robust, especially now that we are approved to be used by teachers in in five different states in, in their schools. Yeah. So we're, we are looking at what are the possibilities for the next few years. Well, so that's it. something it, it's not it's not hammered out yet. But, sure, sure, sure. But there's, there's something there's that conversations we're really going out. on, which is the first yeah. step. Right. And I will tell you, I will be your big, biggest advocate in all of this. And maybe robust wasn't the great, greatest word to use because what you guys do is so robust. I mean, Thank you. It, there's so many topics that you cover and so many people that you cover. It, it, it is massive. But when it comes to like math or science or all these other things and just having maybe a prayer you curriculum, like for homeschool. Math families. that's not racist. Right, right. And, and then, <laughs> totally. I mean, hello, that would be an amazing thing. But as a homeschool parent now, I'm looking at things differently and I'm like, hmm, I love PragerU and I homeschool now and we do have these resources, but I would love to be able to support PragerU in more ways and be able to utilize content even more. Of course, that puts more work on you guys and I don't pay the bills <laughs> necessarily myself. We're here for it. <laughs> um, but I think these are all phenomenal things to be talking about. I know we're short on time. I want to ask you one last question, and we've kind of touched on it here and there. For those who are hesitant to speak out, parents who are nervous, parents who are uncomfortable, um, the name of this show is Speak Out. How would you encourage them? What one piece of advice would you give them to speak out on behalf of their children, on behalf of education? Okay, so a few words. Have heart. We got to keep the heart. We have to be respectful and kind. We also need to be organized with the facts. Find specific facts. If you are going to a school board meeting, if you are writing a letter, find one or two facts, real life things that happened with your child or in your district, facts. And third, you just have to be brave. And that sounds very trite and, you know, oh, how cliche, be brave. But there really is, it's tough to be brave. And there really is a lot that goes into taking that first step to, you know, knowing that after I send this email or after I address the school board or after I say this to the teacher, there's no going back. And you have to be brave to take that first step because once you take that first step, there really is an indescribable feeling of accomplishment. And you feel as though I've done something purposeful. You really do feel that, 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 that wonderful feeling of I've done something meaningful, I've done something purposeful for the benefit not only of my child, but for the benefit of my community, and if you want to put it in larger terms, my country. So that, that's what I say. Yeah, absolutely. If not you, then who? Who's going right. to do it? Uh, Jill, thank you so much for joining us. Where can they find all the PragerU stuff? Where can they find you on social media? Um, give us one little last rundown before we sign off. Okay, so I'm on Instagram at Jill Simonian, and I always do all sorts of videos about what's happening in schools and what's happening in this school district or that school district. And uh, and our PragerU Kids is also on Instagram. So you can follow us at PragerU Kids. And for the website, it's PragerUKids.com. It's free. You can subscribe for free and get all of the information in your inbox a few times a week. Awesome. Thank you so much for joining, Jill. I appreciate it. And um, I love everything you guys are doing over at PragerU. Can't sing enough praises. Thank you. Back at you. Thank you for all you do. We appreciate you.